Hey there, welcome back to another video. This time around, it is my review of the 1993 action thriller, Striking Distance. Now, Striking Distance is one of those films that I liked. I thought it was pretty good. I don't think it was a great film by any means, though. I can see why people have some murky recollections of it. Because there's a lot of things about this that are pretty forgettable. And I can see why it didn't do that well either in the box office or with critics. Like, there's not really a lot when it comes to this movie that is something that makes it stand out. That makes it into something that's that special. It's fine. Uh, it's not a film that has a lot of things or really anything about it that's poor or awful. But it's also not a film where you're like, yeah, striking distance. Like, that is a really great movie. At least not for me personally. It's like one of those films where you're like, oh, I like Bruce Willis. And uh, there are a couple well-shot action sequences. And I like the idea of a film of this type focusing on boat cops. But, it, it, but it's one of those things where it just didn't come together into something that was that grand or, or that spectacular. Uh, the film is directed by uh, Rowdy Harrington. And I think for the most part, Rowdy Harrington did a really good job. I don't think the direction of this film is an issue in any capacity, to be honest. Uh, I think it's definitely one of the more striking aspects of this movie overall is the direction by Rowdy Harrington. Um, in particular, I really love the opening credits. It's very unique. It has a certain style to it that I can't really say I've seen in a lot of other films. Just the way that he shot this miniature police car as it's driving around the legs of a, of a victim uh, was really intriguing. It was a really interesting way to shoot the opening credits. And the action sequences are amazing in this film. When they are there, they are punchy. They have a lot of impact. They have a lot of force to them. Uh, and they are something that definitely does stick with you. If anything is going to stick with you when it comes to this movie, it's stuff like the car chase uh, during the first 30 minutes of the movie, which I honestly have to say after watching this film is probably one of the more underrated car chases that I've seen in any movie. Like, the car chase is that fucking good. Like, I, I recommend anyone who's a fan of action films just to watch this film just for that car chase alone. Now, there are some other sequences that are well shot in this film, too. Like, the speedboat chase near the end of the movie... Uh, there's a fun action sequence with some fisticuffs and some gunplay featuring Bruce Willis's character where he, where he gets on a boat and takes out some bad guys. And I have to admit, the way that he shot some other uh, scenes in the film were very eerie and atmospheric and, and definitely had a, a, a bit of an edge to them. And... Uh, not anything that's super flashy or or visually stunning, but but very effective. Uh, and I want to give Rowdy Harrington a lot of credit too for dealing with a very turbulent star in Bruce Willis, because Bruce Willis, uh, from what I've been reading and from what I've heard, when it comes to people that worked on this film, like the director Rowdy Harrington, for instance. Bruce Willis was making tsunami-sized waves on the set of this movie. And that had to be really difficult for any filmmaker to deal with. But in particular, Rowdy, because this was his film. He not only directed this movie, but he also co-wrote the film. So Bruce Willis comes on board. He's hired to do the movie. And he just starts taking over the production. He starts changing scenes. He starts coming up with stuff off the top of his head. He turns it from a Rowdy Harrington film into a Bruce Willis movie. And you can see why Rowdy Harrington was not very pleased. To say the light it. To say... <laughs> I mean... 
forgive me for uh, not being able to speak there for a second, but it, it just kind of upsets me just thinking about it. Because if I was in rowdy shoes, damn right I would be upset. I don't care if Bruce Willis is a huge movie star. I'd be like, what the fuck, Bruce? Uh, I didn't know this was a Bruce Willis film. Uh, are you the director now? Are you the writer now? I I'm fine with uh, you providing me with some ideas. And maybe I might incorporate some of them. But this is my movie. Like, what the fuck, man? And yeah, he took over the production. And what's kind of funny is apparently a lot of the stuff that he wanted shot and a lot of a lot of the scenes that were filmed based on his uh, suggestions, they were cut out of the movie because there was a disastrous screening and the audiences were not really that enthusiastic about Bruce Willis's additions. So the film had to go into more reshoots and had to be edited. And a lot of the stuff that Bruce Willis came up with was cut out of the movie. So Bruce Willis took over the film at one point, started making serious waves. And then by the end of it, uh, a lot of his stuff didn't even make it into the final cut. I find that pretty hilarious. And I like Bruce and I, I've always been a fan of Bruce Willis as an actor, especially when it comes to his prime. But it really does seem like he was a very difficult guy to work with for a lot of different people. And while he might not have been as difficult with some directors as he was with others, there was just this trend of Bruce Willis just being an egotistical prick and it, I, I I really feel bad and that he has to deal with what he's dealing with right now in terms of his health issues but at the same time that doesn't condone what he did it doesn't condone his behavior and I know I think he knows that too I think as Bruce has gotten older he's probably had he's probably going through a phase where he has a lot of regrets and uh or not maybe he doesn't i don't know but i i just i don't understand why he thought that a lot of this behavior was acceptable probably because he felt like he was untouchable his ego was like the size of hollywood at the time or the nakato or, or at the very least the nakatomi plaza in die hard and he felt like he could do anything and he could take over a film production and and nobody would bat an eye and you know he kind of he was right because he took over striking distance and the studio didn't really do do much to stop him and i find it interesting that he was able to wield that much power especially after hudson hawk a film where he wielded a lot of the same power and the film was a huge bomb. So I'm really kind of surprised that the studio allowed him to have the same uh, power on the set of Striking Distance. Because it didn't really show that he was able to wield it to uh, the best results. And what I also find pretty funny and ironic is that this film's tagline is about Bruce Willis's character. And how if... if they didn't want him making waves. They shouldn't have put him back into the water. Like they shouldn't have put him in the, into the water if they didn't want him to make waves. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> uh, that's true in so many different ways when it comes to this movie, not just with the tagline and not just with the film's plot. So yeah, I give Rowdy Harrington, uh, extra credit for dealing with Bruce Willis's difficult ass during the the filming of this movie uh also it's another one of those instances where despite the troubled production it didn't really show up on the screen rowdy was still a professional he still stuck his nose to the grindstone so to speak went to work and uh delivered a relatively solid product despite dealing with all this bullshit with Bruce Willis. 
Speaking of Rowdy, like I said, he also co-wrote the film with Marty Kaplan. And Striking Distance, for me, is a movie that you can definitely tell, when it comes to the writing at least, did have somebody come in and start splashing around and making their own waves. Because one of my issues with this film is its inconsistency when it comes to its tone. This is a movie that has a very wild and uneven tone at times. It's all over the place. It's a serious crime drama thriller. But then it's also trying to be some kind of rom-com or uh, a Bruce Willis movie with Bruce Willis making quips and acting like he's some version of Joe Hallenbeck from uh, The Last Boy Scout but this time he's a boat cop, you know, that kind of thing. And it's like, I get why it's there, but at the same time, I don't think that really works with the more serious stuff, the more serious dramatic stuff, stuff showcasing that uh, the character played by Bruce Willis, uh, Tom Hardy, is a uh, former cop who was injured and in, in a in that car accident that ultimately caused his father to die. And he, he had a friend of his in the police department who committed suicide in front of him. And so it's one of those things where he's always, he's dealing with a lot of really traumatic shit. And then he's, you know, making jokes and he got references to the Simpsons and he got all this other sort of stuff that I just don't really feel lands and on top of that you got this romance between tom and joe and i did not think that was anything that was effective i don't think it worked i didn't think that the way that the romance was written uh worked in any capacity it just didn't feel genuine it didn't feel earned it just felt like, oh, let's just have these two be a couple now. And that's the problem with a lot of films uh, of this type that that feature a male lead and then have a female co-star. For some reason, they always feel like they have to become an item uh, uh, in the middle of the movie. And I just don't think it was at all anything that the film needed it was fine enough that they were friends and they were colleagues they didn't have to also be a couple that was not necessary and also when it comes to this movie the twist at the end was pretty predictable i gotta be honest there was only one or two paths that this boat could go to and one of them was that path uh, I, and I get it. I understand why it went in that direction, but I just think they could have done a better job obscuring things. I mean, you could fucking tell that it was the guy because he was wearing the same gloves. Like the, 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 the for some reason, the costume designer or the director or whoever, I don't know, maybe this was Bruce Willis's idea. I don't know whose idea it was, but they had Robert Pastorelli, wear the same gloves in every scene that he was in. So the driver of the car during the car chase, who was the serial killer, was wearing these very distinctive gloves. And then uh, he was also wearing the same gloves when he was a cop, pretty much, when he was not behind the wheel of a car. And then later on, when he's driving the car... Uh, after his character was supposedly dead, it's the same fucking gloves. So they, they gave it away. They ruined a really good setup with the opening credits with this toy police car. And there were some mysterious elements there. And they just, they blew it. They blew it. It was a very small detail. But once you notice that detail, it, it, it's, it, it, there's no, there's no way to, to really be fooled anymore. Like, yep, yeah, it's Robert Pastorelli. I saw it. Yep, knew it. But it's also a problem that a lot of these kind of films have anyway, because there's a lot of just predictable paths that they're going to go to because you've seen so many of these movies. So there's really not a whole lot that they can do to really surprise you or throw you for a loop. 
So at the end of the day, even though that's an issue, it's not really something that makes the film particularly bad by any means. It just is another element that makes the film not able to really get a lot of distance from other films in the genre. But like I said, it's still a film that does have some effective stuff. I like the boat cop element. That's different. That's something that does put a different spin on this kind of story where you have a serial killer who escapes from uh, justice and shows up decades later and he's killing people again, he's trying to frame a, a certain individual for the crime so he can get away with it. But of course things go wrong and now the guy that he's trying to frame is the guy who ends up nailing his ass. It, it, it's, you know, it's that kind of thing. You've seen this kind of plot done before, but not necessarily in this setting and not necessarily with these kind of characters in this profession. So it was, it was refreshing in that sense where you dealt with boat cops dealing with a serial killer instead of beat cops or investigators or detectives. So that did uh, provide a, a little unique flavor to the script. There are some moments with the one-liners and with the jokes where it is a little funny, but there's a lot of stuff, though, that I just didn't feel was that memorable, let alone that uh, hilarious or... Uh, humorous. It was just one of those things where you're just like, huh, okay, all right, uh, uh, I've definitely heard better one-liners than, uh, who's the best cop now? Like, I, that, that, that's your, that's your best, that's your best, that's your final shot. Your final one-liner, um, uh, is who's the best cop now? Uh, but anyway, yeah, not the best when it comes to the one-liners either, but like I said, it does have some things that really do work. I like the dynamic between Joe and Tom uh, when it comes to their working relationship, when they're partners. Uh, I don't really care for the romantic stuff, but I do like the fact that they are, are uh, written in a way where they have some nice banter, some nice back and forth with one another when they're working together uh, on a case. And I also like the fact that at some point in the film, they do reveal that she was doing this whole thing where she was monitoring him and she was lying about who she was, but they don't really focus a lot on that in terms of the whole liar reveal. They kind of move past that fairly quickly so you can get to the climax and whatever. Uh, but at the same time, that's also an element that didn't need, didn't necessarily need to be there. Why does she have to be uh, a cop who's going undercover and keeping an eye on Tom? Why can't she just be a rookie boat cop? Why does she also have to have this other sort of uh, subplot or hidden secret that her character has? It's not as interesting as 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 the writers might think. So just have her be the, the rookie boat cop and then have more scenes with her and Bruce Willis where they're together on the boat busting people or trying to find this killer instead of this whole bit where oh I'm not who who you think I am all right whatever like well, I'm not going to see you anymore and then you know try to do that whole stuff I, I, I know I kind of said that I didn't mind it but now the more I think about it I actually didn't care for it so there's another thing where I'm like, eh, or I'm just indifferent on it. I just don't really care. So yeah, it's, it's one of those scripts where it's fine, but it's not, that's not anything that's like, Oh, holy shit. Wow. What a, what a great screenplay. It, it's an all right script. Now the performances by the cast, despite how difficult he was, Bruce Willis does a good job. I mean, it's not a bad performance by Bruce by any means. Like, this is still a good Bruce Willis performance. Uh, he's still charismatic when he needs to be. He's relatively likable. 
even though his character is a little surly and definitely does hit the bottle and shows up to work late and there are a lot of these other things about him that are uh, not necessarily the best when it comes to his nature. Once again, Bruce still brings that charm. He still brings something to this character that makes you want to root for him. And uh, you definitely do feel for him when he's being framed for these crimes or when he's trying to get people to to understand what he's going through and, and trying to get these cops to realize that uh, the killer is back and he was never really caught and they're just being so defiant that he's wrong. So uh, it's still a good performance by Bruce Willis. Uh, despite the fact that it, he didn't really have the best behavior, so to speak, on the set of Striking Distance. Uh, Sarah Jessica Parker as uh, Emily Harper, Officer Joe Chrisman. She's all right. Uh, I, I don't think she had the best chemistry with Bruce Willis. Uh, I don't really feel that there were a lot of sparks when it comes to uh, those two together despite the fact that I didn't mind the way that they were written, I just didn't feel that the two performers really had a lot of just great chemistry. Like, there's fits and spurts of it, but uh, I, I don't know. It just didn't really feel it. Maybe it's because they tried to force this romantic uh, uh, vibe, this uh, romantic connection into these two, and that really didn't work at all for me. So... Maybe that's why I didn't really feel they had the best chemistry. And plus, her performance is just okay. Like, I, I, I feel you could have had a better actress or something, who had a little bit more under her belt, so to speak, when it comes to doing these kind of films. Uh, there are some moments where she kind of does seem like a fish out of water. Uh, Dennis Farina, he was good as some corrupt asshole captain. Uh... Definitely played the uh, bitter, angry role very well. Tom Sizemore uh, did a great job as uh, Tommy's cousin, Jimmy's brother, uh, and Nick's son. He was also a friend of, uh, yeah, he was friends with Tommy because, you know, he's Tommy's cousin. Uh, I felt that him and Bruce Willis had some good chemistry. Honestly, their chemistry was so good at times that maybe you could have just had... Bruce Willis and Tom Sizemore as partners, uh, as, as, as boat cops, instead of having Sarah Jessica Parker in there. Um, that might have improved the film, too. Brian James, it was fun to see him uh, in this kind of role as this loud, just rude douchebag detective who just hates Tommy and wants to kick his ass. Uh, Robert Pastorelli, he plays uh, the killer uh, Jimmy, um, Robert Pastorelli, I, I thought he was, he was really good. I really liked Robert Pastorelli's performance as the killer, uh, even though it was not really that surprising of a reveal, but it was still a good performance. He was chilling. He was just, a, he played a really good psycho. So, so I will give him a lot of credit for his uh, performance in this. Timothy Busfield, he played a good jerk, good uh, by-the-book, nerdy loser uh, guy who worked at the River Rescue Squad. Uh, the guy who wants to do things by the book. And Bruce Willis is just like, fuck you, and just sends him flying into the water. Uh, John Mahoney played uh, Vince Hardy, Tom's father. And I, I feel that the scenes with Bruce and uh, and him are really special. Like, those two really did uh, have a good bond with one another. I definitely did buy that they were father and son. And you also have, like, Tom Atkins, who plays uh, a, a, another police officer who has, like, a very bit role in the movie. So it was fun to see Tom Atkins. I mean, Tom Atkins. Sorry. I don't know who the fuck Tom Atkins is. That's some other guy, but it was it was uh, it was fun to see uh, Tom Atkins. Uh, Andre Brower is also in this as like one of the, as the DA, like the the district attorney Frank Morris. But yeah, uh, 
the cast is fine. I would say the the standouts are Bruce Willis, Tom Sizemore, and Robert Pastorelli. Everyone else is is adequate, uh, but nothing really that striking overall. The film has some pretty eh, cinematography. Uh, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and say the cinematography is anything that's really that amazing. It, it, it's not a film that really pops in that way. It's decent by Mac Alberg. The editing by Pasquale Buba and Mark Helfrich. I, I, that's another instance of the film where there are moments where it shines, but then there's other, other moments where it's a little bumpy and it, it goes through some rough patches, some rough water, so to speak. Uh, I think that might not necessarily be to due to the editors. It might be due to the fact that they had to cut out a lot of bullshit. So I think that is something that definitely caused some strife for the editors. Uh, and they probably just did the best job that they could, considering that it probably had to cut out a good amount. Uh, because Bruce Willis decided he was going to make it his film and he was going to make it his way. The score by Brad Fidel, it's, it's all right. I, I really think Brad Fidel is, is a phenomenal, talented composer, but there really weren't a lot of bits in this that I thought were great. Uh, there's not really a lot of moments with this score that, uh, I can really recollect off the top of my head. So it's not really a score that you're going to hum along to or hum after the film is over. Uh, it's definitely not right up there with scores like The Terminator. Uh, but it's still decent enough. It's not something that is really that waterlogged or or that uh, bad. It doesn't It doesn't really make the film drown in any capacity. It's not that noticeable. So it's a decent enough score, but it doesn't really do a whole lot to rise above uh, uh, a lot of other scores for the, these kind of films, and definitely not compared to other scores by Brad Fidel. And it has like a running time of 101 minutes, and at times it does admittedly kind of bog down. It, there are times where the engine stalls a little bit, and it's just stuck in the water, and that's when the film is just not as thrilling or as exciting as it is in other moments. This film is at its best when it's in an action sequence, when it's dealing with some speedboat chases or it's dealing with uh, Tom Hardy uh, kicking ass as a boat cop and taking out drug dealers and, uh, with its explosive and just thrilling car chases. Like that's where the film is at its best. When it comes to the other stuff, it's just there. It's just so, so it's nothing that special, but, uh, that's my thoughts on striking distance. And as always, thanks for watching and I'll see you later. See ya.